Okay, perfect. So, welcome everyone. Uh, episode 47, and we are, uh, I am personally super delighted to have Stacey on, because I've been a massive fan of her work for ages. I'm being a bit of a fanboy there, but it's true. Um, she's an assistant professor at East Carolina, Uni East Carolina University. I'm going to let her sort of do a bit more of an intro of herself uh, in a minute, but her field of expertise is, is identifying uh, biomechanical risk factors that uh, result in injury, which is obviously very pertinent to us in the podiatry world uh, and as clinicians. So we want to try and unpick some of the research that she's been doing and that she's going to do and, and, and sort of see how it how it may or may not apply to us in clinic. So, uh, Stacey, thank you so much for your time. Massively appreciate this. I know we contacted you about five months ago to get you on for this one and i've been looking forward to it so thank you and do you mind for anyone that isn't aware of you and and, and who you are and what you do just giving a, a bit of a brief intro of your your background no absolutely um i am from iowa the midwestern part of the united states originally um i started off as an athletic trainer and physical therapist and i practiced um as a physical therapist, athletic trainer, I actually got a background in strength and conditioning uh, for about nine years. Uh, and, and I decided I wanted to go back because uh, for my PhD because I wanted to teach, I loved teaching. Um, so I started my PhD at Iowa State University working with Dr. Tim Derrick, uh, a notable biomechanist. Um, he had an interest in jumping, landing, running um, I had an interest in overuse injuries, and then he sort of was interested in developing an interest at the time in bone. So an overuse injury in bone, kind of stress fracture seemed like a logical fit between us. Um, so I started down this path of, of looking at bone injuries in active populations. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's, I think it's important to know that I started this path very much as a clinician. I had no concept that there was even a way that you could model or simulate human movement um, in, a, in a computer um, because when I was in, in school we were email was just becoming a, a thing um, so <laughs> a far cry I remember the first person presented their thesis with a PowerPoint and we were in awe right like so it, it was a big jump for me to start my PhD um, and you know Tim was a very kind and patient advisor and I learned a ton from him um, but I, I developed a love for uh, being able to quantify the lows that people experience during activity and, and there's lots of ways we can look at injury um, but if I can figure out a way to measure the load that the tissue is experiencing during activity, and then perhaps I can work backwards and find what, uh, which of these factors, either strength, range of motion, individual drop, um, too much hip adduction, whatever, any of these characteristics that we hear all the time, what of those are most important um, and, and that are going to sort of elevate those loads. So that's kind of where I spent most of my time. Um, I didn't intend to spend a lot of time doing models, but that's kind of where I'm at. Perfect. And it seems like a reasonable one to, 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 to kick off with. And, and that is um, with respect to the literature that we currently have. Um, and we, we obviously we have beliefs, long held beliefs and things we've been taught and things we perhaps um, that seem plausible or intuitive with regards to the things that are going to be higher risk factors for injury. Well, what, what do we have the science for right now? So, you know, in the clinic, what things should we be really focusing on, really looking at when we're, when we're screening or assessing people with respect, with respect to risk factors? Well, something I tell my students every day, and, and I think, you know, before the podcast came on, we were talking about this, there are so many different risk factors associated with injury, um, anywhere from intrinsic factors um, to extrinsic factors. If you kind of narrow it down to gait mechanics, if that's what you're looking at, or landing mechanics, whatever activity you're looking at. Um, you could also look at the physical activity patterns as well as the underlying tissue structure. Can, can the tissue tolerate those loads? So I've kind of lumped injury characteristics um, into those three patterns. So I've lumped them into mechanics, physical activity patterns, and then the underlying tissue tolerance. Um, and then within each of those, there's a myriad of factors we can look at, but those ultimately influence the tissue load that we experience during activity. Um, and, you know, we can name a bunch of factors, whether it's strength, range of motion, gait biomechanics, bone geometry, 
exercise dosage, but right there, you're looking at a multiple level ANOVA type problem, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's really hard to solve from a research perspective. So I just tell my students that, you know, the research informs where we should be targeted, targeting our examination and our intervention. Um, but it's really the patient in front of you that you get to look at all of these multifactorial contributing factors or what I like to call mediators or modifiers of injury um, and decide which ones are going to be relevant to address for that patient in front of you. Because not every patient is going to be needing all factors addressed. Um, so I, I ask that my students stay up to date with the factors that are associated with injury and then know that those are the factors that they should be looking at in their exam, um, but that gait mechanics or landing mechanics are only one part of the picture. We also have loading frequency and dosage that have to be paid attention to, as well as what about diet, sleep, all those other factors that may be influencing the biophysiology of the tissue and its ability to tolerate loads. So um, I, I say stay, stay abreast of the literature and know kind of what things you should be examining, but know that your patient may not present with all of those. Um, that's the yeah. And it's a great point, isn't it? That question that we all want a nice succinct answer to or a nice list of things, like you must look at this at the hip. It, it just, I think the answer is clear. It's, it's just not that simple, much as we'd love it to be. Do you think there'll ever be a time where we have the ability to, to, to know enough that it can be that simple? Or do you think it's just always going to be incredibly complex and multifactorial? I think we're getting there. I think we're getting to a better place. I mean, I, I stop and I look back to where we were 10 years ago, and we were talking a lot about external ground reaction forces and kinematics, and it feels like now we're starting to get a little bit more at tissue-specific loads. We're seeing some nice models that can estimate what the body is experiencing and how that changes over time. And, and we can measure structure, uh, whether anywhere from uh, imaging technologies, but I believe there's diagnostic ultrasounds in the clinic too. So we can start to, I think we're moving there. Um, I, I just think it'll be a little while because we now need to do the studies to say, okay, here's, I mean, it's, I applaud the people who do prospective studies because that's a lot of work and a lot of crossing your fingers hoping injuries happen so that you can have something to look at. Um, but I, I do think like the modeling approach where we can estimate loads might help speed up the process because we can start to identify what factors are associated with these detrimental loading environments. Mm. Um, and we might be able to narrow that down a little bit. Um, but my guess is it's going to be a composite Things. It's not going to be hip adduction by itself. It might be hip adduction in combination with elevated ground reaction forces or something like that. I think it's going to be a composite. Yeah, yeah perfect. Uh, sorry, Craig, you going to say something? Oh no, no, no. I'm just <laughs> giving a close eye on things. People, uh, I thought uh, I thought you had something, uh, something, some gold ready. Um, oh, can no, we no. talk a bit about bone injury? Um, because I know you've published several papers in the in the field of bone injury, and, and you've obviously mentioned it a couple of times there. Are there any sort of pearls that you can give us uh, from a from a clinical perspective with regards to the the modelling you've done and and the things that in clinic yeah, the things that we can fairly strongly to tell people they should be doing or not doing? Yeah, I think a couple of things that I would say first is that the tissue has to be able to tolerate the load that's being applied to it. So I think that when people get injured, um, their tissue clearly isn't adapting to the load that's being applied to it. So is there a mismatch between the structure relative to the load that's being applied. I think Kristen Papp has looked at that a little bit in, in uh, stress fracture, looking at bone geometry relative to ground reaction forces and looking at the ratio of those. Um, I think that's a nice step in the right direction. Uh, we, we've had people look at, well, these are the bone factors associated with injury. These are the gait mechanics associated with injury. Uh, these are all the strength and range of motion, but it'd be nice to put all of that together uh, to, to see sort of where what's the most relevant in all of these. But I do think ultimately you have to have a good, strong bone. And I think when you're working with people who have bone injuries, something that falls by the wayside is 
what is their underlying bone structure and their bone strength, right? So PQCT is nice because it gives you both geometry as well as density. But most of the patients that I've worked with who struggled with bone stress injuries, they're, you know, they're, they're often told just to back off running and let it rest and then ease back into it. And so I, I think there's some things rel relative to um, the, the nutrition that you can look at. There's things relative to some imaging that you can maybe get to see how, how quality the bone is, because if we can improve their bone when they're still in this peak time, I think that's going to be really important. Um, you know, are there exercises that we can do to better prime the bone for the activity that the, our, our, our people are, are undergoing? Um, you know, those high intensity activities separated by bouts of rest are actually very osteogenic in nature. Um, so maybe we need to do more building the bone to tolerate the loads that are applied to it. So, so I would say, one, don't forget that it's, it's not just about the, the things that we can measure right in front of us, but we might want to think about how we can quantify tissue quality or tissue strength. The other thing that I don't want to underestimate is physical activity patterns. Um, I, I think looking at how they're loading, there's some really nice research coming out right now about acute to chronic workload ratios and how if your acute workload exceeds your chronic workload, um, I think it's you know, by, by more than 20%, then you're gonna be at risk for injury, not just today, but in the next few weeks. And I think that that's really important to sort of educate your, your patients on and figure out a way, how can we track this so we can give people uh, better guidance on how to build their exercise tolerance so as not to get injured. Um, and so I, I think those bone structure and physical activity patterns are, are two that we can address fairly readily and then when you get into the underlying tissue load itself that it's experienced, well, why is it? Is, it, is there things that if, if we see some miserable mechanics, what can we do to change it, right? So look at the logical culprits based upon what you see in front of you um, and then come up with a, a sort of intervention that fits, um, whether that be footwear, whether that be gait retraining, um, whether that be um, coordinated training, you know, muscular education, those orthotics yeah perfect there's there's a there's a, a doctor a consultant i work with who uh, pretty much puts everyone on vitamin d i mean we, we're in england so it's, as you as i'm sure you know it's a gray with a chance of rain whether it's january august or, or november and um whoever he sees he just assumes they're vitamin d deficient until proven otherwise and puts them on vitamin d whereas there's another doctor i work with who working alongside the other team he'd, he'd take your approach which is well if if you're looking at the load that's been applied and it's reasonable and there's been no violation of the acute to chronic ratio or no spike in load it's something that the bone should tolerate and it and it seemingly hasn't that's his flag for considering those kind of things where do you sit between those kind of two opinions slight differences well, in approach I, I probably err on the side of maybe looking at bone bone quality a little sooner rather than later simply because this the, the the age group of people getting bone stress injuries tends to be in your second and third decades um and that is the prime time for building bone uh, that's gonna our bone stores to last us a lifetime and you know if we're not doing a good job building bone and the bone is weak at this point i think i'd like to know um, what are those contributing factors so I can mediate them sooner rather than later because it's just such a critical time for bone development. Yeah. So I guess the answer to that would be I'd probably sit somewhere between the two doctors. <laughs> <laughs> somewhere in the middle. Perfect. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's, there's um, clear red flags that you need to do it sooner if there's amenorrhea, but unfortunately men don't have that red, that sort of uh, mm. flag for, for health professionals to, to look at. So um, but there's plenty of men who sustain stress injuries too. Um, and I just think it'd be worthwhile, especially given the critical bone development age that these people are in, that we take a little closer look and make sure that things are, are in line. So I would look yeah. at my, I would look at sleep habits, I would look at calcium, I would look at, you know, if you can get an image or some sort of, 
you know, while I like PQCT, DEX is still pretty well accepted. So can you get something like that just so, so they can see where they're at? Um, and it might be important to sort of look at them, not necessarily relative. I mean, you still have to look at that, that this person, if they have a normal bone density or bone geometry compared to the masses, you know, you, you'd like to have them compared to somebody who's experiencing similar activities, right? Because they should be a little on the higher end to be able to tolerate the loads they're putting on themselves. Yeah, perfect. And I think it's a, a reasonable reminder that even as, 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 as podiatrists, where someone comes in with shin pain, we should be asking them about their sleep and what diet they take and whether they're a smoker and, and these things that they're, they're, they're not, that they're incredibly relevant. Um, seems like a, a reasonable segue to get into talking about medial tibial stress syndrome. Um, and uh, as, as you know, when, from when I emailed you several months ago, um, one of my favorite papers of yours, if not my favorite paper uh, of, of anyone's is, is your work on step width modification um, and the ability it has to modify the tibial stress. Um, I'm sure there aren't too many people watching this that haven't read it, but if there, if there, if there, in case there are, could you just give us a bit of a summary of that paper before we, we talk a bit more about it? Yeah, so the impetus for that paper was I had done some cadaver work. I'd measured bone strain in second metatarsal um, with different orthotics, custom and semi-custom orthotics. Um, and I was like, well, I don't want to keep measuring bone strain this way. I want to find another way to measure it. So we went into the modeling route. Um, so we met, went in to try to estimate tibial stress, but in order for us to tell if the way we ran actually influenced those loads that the tibia experienced and, and if our model was sensitive to it, I was looking for a way to modify gait so that I could produce an environment that I thought would have higher bone stresses. Um, and so looking through the literature, step width, ironically, has a fair number of gait mechanics associated with it that parallel uh, what's reported in the literature uh, for stress, risk factors for stress fractures. So we did a gait um, modification study. They were running over ground and we had uh, people run at um, their normal step width and then we had them run at 5% of their leg length greater, 5% of their leg length less. Um, we gave them feedback after every trial to, to let them know if they met that criteria. Um, and they had to maintain a consistent, their preferred, their 5K running pace of what I was doing at the time. So they, they did that. And then we used um, a combination of, so clearly we collected motion capture data uh, and ground reaction forces. And we input that into a series of musculoskeletal models to estimate tibial bone stress. So with this study, I, I use a, sim a simplistic model of the tibia um, which may be considered a limitation by some, but that being said, everybody had um, a similar tibia, and so then I could sort of see if the forces alone make a difference, right? So, um, because we know that true stress is an artifact of both the structure as well as the applied. So in this way, I was kind of controlling the tibia uh, component and just manipulating the loads. And what we found was, you know, with, with changes in step width, you know, we can manipulate that bone stress environment. Um, so we, we were, um, which, and it suggested that if, if you were maybe narrow to begin with, that it might be beneficial to widen your step width a little bit more. Um, and uh, it's not a huge, 5% of your leg length, it wasn't a huge amount, so it's not a huge adjustment that you have to make. Um, but you do have to be a little cautious because it is gonna be a different motor pattern. Um, and if you take load off of one area, you're going to put it somewhere else. So you have to adjust your, your training patterns if you're going to adopt something like that. Um, and so that was the base of that study. Um, and we found. Yeah, so the way, the way, rightly or wrongly, and do call me out on this if, I've, if I'm translating it into my clinical practice incorrectly, but the way I've interpreted that is that it's a really good intervention to... To, to modify someone's step width if they're symptomatic. Um, I've never personally used it um, for prevention of problems, like if someone was, was very narrow. Is, is, is that a fair way to use it? Or do you think there's a scope here for, for taking someone who's very narrow or even crossing over or scissoring and saying, well, why don't we just, we think we've got the ability to modify tibial stress to your benefit here. Is there, have we got the data to, to back that up? 
so, so like you, most of the time, I mean, in research studies, I've, I've asked healthy people to manipulate their step weight, and we see reductions in IT bands, we see reductions in tibial stress, and, and I was showing Craig beforehand, we also see some reductions in hip joint contact forces when we ask them to run a little bit lighter. Um, so they've responded well to it. Again, I'm hesitant if, if they're running and they're not getting injured, I'm hesitant to mess with something that's working. Um, most of the people who I've implemented on, like you, have been in the clinic where they've been symptomatic and we've made a small change and it seems to have been beneficial. But I haven't done any uh, prospective studies forward in terms of an intervention to see those long-term effects or, or how that works. But I can just say anecdotally, I've had success using it in the clinic for the people who are, who are narrow to begin with. Um, yeah, that makes sense, so, doesn't it? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I yeah, I, I get a little hesitant because if you look, running wider it is going to cost more energy, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. more energetically costly. Um, and I suspect that if somebody is sort of self-selecting a narrower step width, that there might be a reason for it. A, it, it is more economical, um, but B, there, there could be some issues with lateral balance related to it. Um, and so it's possible that, that if you have them run a little bit wider and they don't have the sort of postural control abilities for that wider stance, you know, you could set off some other problems too. So. I like it and I implement it when necessary. Perfect. Can I ask you, both within the research study, but also if you implement it sort of clinically as well, how, how what cues you gave to widen step? Because we we play around with cues in clinic and I've got different cues to some of the ones that the physios use. And obviously some individuals respond to one cue or, or not, and then you have to mix it up. What What's your preferred method of, of getting someone to run wider? So... In the ideal world, we would choose some sort of external cue, right, mm -hmm. um, versus an internal cue. So what is the effect of the action or, or something relative to the environment rather than um, relative to themselves? So I would say I would use a mirror, right, and I would, you know, maybe put a marker or sometimes I just tell them to run wider, right, just watch themselves in the mirror and just run wider. I keep it really simple. Um, sometimes I'll put markers and I'll just be like, you know, don't let the markers touch or keep the markers apart. Um, if they're using mirror feedback, um, over ground, I've used, you know, a line, right? So if you're running, um, try to, you know, look at this line and use that as a, a cue in terms of running on either side of the line. Um, as long as it's not too wide of a line, because you can create a whole set of, another set of problems by running too wide, I think. And it's fine. <laughs> um, but, uh, I have used simple things like, I want you to have your, you know, I want you, um, I want your foot directly underneath your shorts, right? And I kind of point to the, or if they got a logo under their, on their shorts, I'll use that because it's a little more external. Um, you know, but I think initially before I, I knew the research about external cues, I think I would give cues like, just a run wider or, or sort of run so your foot's under directly underneath your head. Something like that. Yeah. And they would never go uh, quite that way, but they would go a little bit wider. Yeah. But those are the relatively small things that, that I've used. How about you? What do you use? I must confess, uh, personally, I'm quite a fan of the line. Um, so on, 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 on the running track, one of the clinics I work, we've got a running track inside it. So I'll get them to sort of stand in the lane, I'll get them to straddle two lanes. Mm -hmm. And the running track line tends to be, you know, about the thickness of a foot-ish. So I'll just tell them to, you know, miss the line, but not John Wayne miss it, sort of mm -hmm. miss it marginally left with the left foot, marginally right with the right foot. And if that's a cue that seems to work them, but they don't have access to a running track and they can't run on a field where there's a football pitch marked out, I'll often give them some tape of about the same width and put it down the middle of a treadmill belt um, that they can use in the gym and obviously take it off before they leave. So I'm, I'm quite a fan of the line. And I must admit, if they don't take well to that, I, I, I start to struggle with sort of knowing a good alternative. But I quite like your short logo one. I'm a, I'm a fan of that. I might try that, actually. That sounds good. Um, your, your other paper, your other step with paper, which again is, is, is something I, I enjoy, is, is pretty much the same. from what I gather, it was a pretty similar methodology, but you looked at the strain in the ITB 
Um, and if we can move semi or move away from MTSS and into ITB, because I know you've published several papers in that area. Um, Craig and I have, have talked about this before and ITB is a bit of a, it feels like it isn't a mystery, but at the same time still feels like it is a bit of a mystery. Certainly I, I sometimes don't feel like I've got a full, full understanding of, of the, the things that people that present with ITB do, whereas certain other pathologies, you tend to see patterns and trends. Could you give us a bit of, could you get us up to speed uh, with ITB um, in, in a nutshell? Yeah, so it's been a while since I've looked at the most recent literature in that area. I haven't published there for a while, but um, I, I sort of, uh, a friend of mine once made fun of me, they're like, can you study any condition that's remedied a little easier? Easier because both tibial stress syndrome and IT band syndrome aren't your easiest conditions to, to sort of remedy. Um, but it makes it a very rewarding population to work with. Um, I would say, you know, the IT band, again, um, looking at their mechanics and anything that would sort of, we know where the IT band runs from the hip down across the knee and, and attaches kind of distal inferior. Um, it, you know, it's, there's some, some people have almost described it more of a, of a, a bursitis type of condition or an impingement um, that, that happens. Um, so I think if, when you look at it, it, it's a multifactorial problem. Again, I tend to look a little bit more, you do need to look at the physical activity patterns in this group as well, but I, I find that gait mechanics, looking at the hip adduction, looking a little bit more at what the, the rear foot is doing, um, looking at the degree of the knee or, or hip internal rotation um, can be problematic. And so I try to, you know, once you can get them a, being less symptomatic, then that's a population I tend to do a little bit more gait modification as I ease them back into activity. Um, so part of that process starts with um, the rehab process. So I've always been a believer of it's like has to be a functional progression. Um, so I would introduce, you know, I know in order to get people to get better at running, you have to run, right? So you have to do that. But it's also nice if you can put some controlled loads on tissue so tissue has a chance to adapt. And it also gives your patient an opportunity to sort of learn some new motor strategies. So, you know, I've done some low level plyometrics progression from double leg to single leg prior to getting them to return back to running. And so that's a population I'm just really conservative and I, I back off, I get them um, going through a progression where they can tolerate double leg and single leg loads in good form and technique prior to initiating the return to running program, just because they, they flare up so easily. Yeah, my, my clinical experience and my interpretation of the literature is that it's far more of a proximally driven problem than a, than a distally driven problem. And actually I find that if, if ITB makes it to me to be asked for a foot level opinion, it's probably because they're just trying to make sure no stone is left unturned, but the majority of them we're, we're rehabbing proximally and we're modifying their step width. Is there any literature I'm missing out on here? Is there any big suggestion that the foot is a, is a, is a strong sort of, there's a strong ascending component to ITB that I've missed? I haven't, I, I honestly am not um, terribly familiar. Craig, do you know of anything more recent with the IT band, with the, with the foot? I can't think of anything. Can Craig? I, Sorry, I, the, dog, <laughs> the dogs were barking, so I turned my microphone off. Um, I'll have a quick look and I'll get back to you in a minute, so keep going. <laughs> okay. I, I, I think that's a great question. Um, and I can just say that uh, I always, you can see the hip adduction, the knee internal rotation, and oftentimes what comes along with that then is the rear foot pronation or vice versa, right? You can have more of a, uh, you can kind of go the opposite direction and still have some additional strain on that IT man. So um, I, I guess I'm, I agree with you that it's more proximal, um, but I'm not sure what the research says about distal con contributors to um, IT and syndrome. It's just been a while since I've looked at it. Yeah, and I think your point's great about people sometimes looking at someone who's, and they sort of make a comment on their uh, sort of pronation magnitude of foot level. But if they're if they're incredibly narrow and their foot's being presented to the ground in therefore in much more inverted attitude, then then it does tend and does tend to to influence kinematics down there. And I think if we modify their step width, we know we get the win 
from your work on the reduction in strain in the ITB, we're probably going to see a change in those rear foot patterns secondary to modifying step width. At least that's my my experience. I don't know if you you would sort of agree with that. I think so. I think so. I, I think I've seen I, I TBN syndrome kind of emerge in a couple different mechanisms. One being the one that we essentially replicated in the study, which is the sort of narrow step width. Um, approach and then the secondary effects it has at the foot. But I've also seen, and I haven't studied this, so that's why I can't speak to it, but I've also seen clinically the patient who kind of has that miserable malalignment syndrome who presents with IT band syndrome. So, so I suspect there may be some nonlinear relationships between some of this, these motions and alignments that we see with um, IT band syndrome. Yeah. A couple of your papers I've come across have talked about, um, they've used the phrase exhaustive running. Um, so you've studied some of these sort of mechanical patterns, and I'm guessing that just means under the effects of, of fatigue. Um, fatigue's not an area I'm super, super knowledgeable on, so forgive the, probably the horribly basic question, but I mean, clearly fatigue has an effect. Is it, is it, is it profound? Do we need to be considering this when we assess people in clinic? Because we often get them in perform a gait analysis and take some video after they've been on there for, for three minutes or four minutes? Should we, should we be waiting till, should we get them on the treadmill for 30 minutes before we assess them? So that's a really good question. Um, I, I've done several studies in the area of fatigue uh, and, you know, not surprisingly, you can get some mechanic changes over the course of an exhaustive run. Um, Again, it's not always consistent from study to study when, when you look at that, but part of that could be um, the definitions of fatigue that are used, or that's why I, I tend to stick with the term exhaustive run, because it's not as physiologically defined as um, uh, a fatigue. So um, I, I tend to use the term exhaustive run. Uh, so I think there's a lot of variance in the literature on the effects of fatigue. That being said, over the course of a prolonged run, you know, you are getting tired. So I would expect to see some changes um, in your motor strategies over the course of the run based upon the fact that you're getting tired. So the question is, is are those things detrimental? Um, I, we have looked at it relative to patellofemoral stress and I don't believe I have to go back and look. It's kind of bad that I can't always remember the results of the study that I was on. <laughs> um, I don't believe we saw a huge difference in patellofemoral loads over the course of an exhaustive run. And similar, we've done some preliminary research looking at tibial stress, and we're not seeing a huge uptick in tibial stress at the end of a prolonged run. So yes, things well, there's this conjecture that we get injured more when we're fatigued but do we really mm. i don't know yeah, yeah you, just just t tim tim's just asked an interesting question it was about how about getting patients to come in pre-fatigued yeah so run to clinic or something like yeah. that run, yeah. run, run to clinic or or get to clinic half an hour earlier and meet me in the gym kind of stuff that's yeah, yeah. What, do, what are your thoughts on that stacy we have to think it's worthwhile to look at them in, in both situations. Um, I think it'd be worthwhile to look at them at the beginning of the run and then looking at them at the end of the run and seeing what's happening. Um, I, I think that there's merit to that um, and then using your best clinical judgment in terms of determining, okay, what is it, you know, wow, this really falls apart. We need to maybe not have them run so far, right? Maybe have them stop sooner than that um, and, until they can get conditioned um, but I don't know. I, 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 I find fatigue to be kind of a sticky one because I, I gave a talk at CSM a, a few years ago on fatigue and running and, you know, it's, it's the idea of do the tissue loads actually change that are injurious by the end of the run. And um, if they're not, then, then maybe some of those adaptations are not as bad as we think they are. Sure. Actually, just, yeah, just back to that previous discussion about the foot and iliotibial band, there's, there's really nothing being published in the last couple of years, but I, I have to share this one. I, I thought this, this is what I did find. Um, 
the iliotibial band flexibility and uh, hallux valgus, bunions. <laughs> and the, the conclusion was stretching of the iliotibial band should be considered during the rehabilitation of hallux valgus. Um, oh. Yeah, but anyway, let's not go that way. <laughs> that was all I could find on the foot and iliotibial band published in the last, at least the last couple of years. Um, um, so, can we, Stacey, can we, you, you do a lot of modelling of human tissue, obviously. Um, can, can we, just on the comment there, can we stretch the ITB? You've, you've got two schools of thought on this, haven't you? Where, where in the running magazines, they show you how to stretch it. And then you look at it from a tensile sort of load perspective. And, and I've read comments that it's got the a tensile strength comparable to aluminium or something like that. Well, I mean, what's the, what's the sort of current thoughts? I don't know. To be honest, I'm not sure that I can answer that question. Um, we, we know that during, at least the way we've assessed it dynamically, there's a change in length because that's essentially what um, the musculoskeletal model is assessing. Um, so at, at least dynamically, we think that there's some subtle changes in, in length um, and, and that may lead to some compression of the lateral knee. Probably not the best answer, but no, no, um, it's fine. I just wondered if I was missing out. I always like to try and learn something along the way. Um, bit of a detour, bit of a <laughs> bit of a detoured question um, that, that someone sent in. What does um, what does a normal day look like for you? Um, you know, because I know you do some teaching and clearly you do some research and you're lab based, and it sounds like you're still a bit clinical as well. So, what, what's a day? What does a day in your life uh, look like? Just in case someone's thinking about this sort of clinical academic role that does always sound quite enticing and, and, and sort of interesting. Well, I would say the biggest benefit of the academic life that I lead is the flexibility. So I've got three kids, um, but that flexibility does come out of class. A lot of times I'm up at 4 a.m. My peers like to make fun of me because if I'm really stressed, I'm up between 2 a.m. And, and 3 a.m. getting work done before anybody in the household wakes up or before I get to the office and somebody needs me to put out a fire. Um, I love what I do, and so it's really easy to take on too much. Uh, so <laughs> you know, once I, uh, oftentimes I work for several hours, and then I get kids and family ready and out the door, and then I, I head into the office, um, and it's course prep, it's teaching, it's meeting with students, it's meeting and collaborating with other researchers, uh, debating, you know, like we're spending a lot of time right now looking at different models and imaging techniques, What what can we use, what should we use, because when it comes to research, you just make the best decision that you can. It's really hard to do these studies and have the perfect study. I'm not sure if there is anything that it, that is a perfect study. Um, so, you know, there's all these steps that go in, um, and so that's, and, and staff meetings, um, we give lab tours. I mean, so on any given day, you're just um, kind of asked to, you know, be available. We have open door policies, so students, faculty, you know, committees that we're on, people to stop in throughout the day. So sometimes, it's, I mean, it, it's a beautiful life. I love it. It can be sometimes hard to carve out sort of that dedicated time to stay up with uh, the things I should be staying up with. Um, but like I mentioned, once I start sitting down and writing papers, then I start looking um, a little more at the literature again to see, you know, what I should be taking into consideration, or if I'm starting a new study, I do the same. So. Lots of student meetings, lots of study design, lots of working with subjects, data collections. It's a pretty busy Perfect. day. And if, it's <laughs> if it's appropriate to ask, and obviously don't don't feel the pressure to to answer, what sort of stuff are you working on at the moment? So in the minds of the researchers, what are the what, what are the future topics that they think we really need to know more about this? Are there, you know, what what are your current processes with regards to okay as far as injury risk is concerned this is where this is where we need to take things moving forward yeah so i am spending a lot of time still still working on refining the model for being able to quantify tissue load um sort of there's always you know late and great imaging technologies or modeling approaches that can be implemented so that's that's something that's always an active ongoing thing I'm also 
trying to do a better job of being um, looking at more of uh, taking on a statistical approach that looks at mediators and modifiers so that we can maybe start to capture um, what's the interaction of all of these risk factors uh, that that are presented in, in the literature relative to an injury what's the relationship of those amongst the tissue loads that people are actually experiencing so Part of it is me learning new statistical techniques to sort of do um, a larger data analysis uh, type, I guess. Um, and then I'm also very interested in the structure. I'm kind of on this kick right now is, you know, is the structure adapted to tolerate the loads that we're asking uh, it to sustain um, relative not only to the acute load, but also the cumulative load. So peak and cumulative loads. So. Those are the things I've been looking at. Yeah. Very cool. Different loading programs, different ways of running, all of those stuff. I'm keeping cumulative loads probably. Awesome. Um, Craig, is there anything uh, that's come through the no. comments on the Facebook group that we need to bring nothing, up or address? Nothing, nothing of any note. No, just you know, a few highs. As a, was a comment about functional hallux limitus perhaps being involved in a tibial band, but um, that's a whole new topic we can get into another time. Um, I don't know there's much data for that, is there? Yeah, no. I can't, go, can't think of seeing any yeah. of that. Um, there was one, there's one last question on my list, and um, I've left it till last because it is a, is, a, is a bit of a, a topic that could, uh, could scare people off. Uh, and it's, it's, the, it's the phrase, the free, the free moment. And again, there's several of your papers that have referred to the free moment. And there was, as, as Craig and you and I were talking about before we went live, um, Brooks brought out a shoe, uh, I think it was last year or the year before, and it was referring to the free moment and, and its relationship with injury. So people may have heard of it. They may be aware of it. They may know what it is. They may have no idea what we're talking about. And um, given your ability to sort of take these things and simplify them for, 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 for the simple people like me, um, could you just talk us through what, what free moment is and does it have any relevance to us as clinicians? What do we do with this information when we, when we read it in, in the research? So ironically, the free moment was probably one of the first biomechanical concepts that made sense to me as a clinician when I went back for my PhD. Um, it, it's, a, it's a measure uh, that you can uh, obtain from the, the ground reaction force data collections um, so from the force plate, and it essentially reflects what it's described as representing the torsion of the lower extremity. So if you can imagine the, the foot and then the ground, and then the foot kind of torsioning either internally or externally called abduction or adduction, you can get this uh, torsion that is transferred up the lower extremity. Um, and so it acts about the vertical axis. Uh, some of the original work um, was done looking at medial and lateral heel wedges to looking at rear foot pronation relative to the effects on this torsion of the lower extremity. Um, I like it. I think it's a great concept. Um, you need a force plate to measure it, so I'm not sure that you can actually measure it um, very well in the clinic at this point. Um, so, but I, I think there's some, some inference, you know, that if we can find a decent surrogate that could estimate sort of what the experience, what, what we're uh, able to measure with more of our models, then, then maybe we can find a clinical way to measure that. Um, but generally the free moment has been associated both, oftentimes if you can imagine the, the torsion into abduction and adduction, too much either direction is probably not good. Um, so a lot of people will just take the absolute free moment because they think um, it's, it's bad either direction you go. So that's what you'll see in the literature. Um, it can be manipulated by things like, you know, rear foot footwear and, and things like that, rear foot wedges and, and footwear um, and controlling pronation. So um, to the extent that we think it's a problem, then, then you might want to direct some interventions accordingly. Um, the free moment has been associated with uh, tibial stress injuries in females. I haven't seen it as much in males, um, but uh, I think Milner and her colleagues have found some stuff in females. Creeby didn't find it in his male runners. Um, so 
I, I thought it was interesting. I was actually interested in the free moment, um, not necessarily by the free moment by, the, by itself, but what if the free moment was occurring at the same time that we were getting like a peak axial force, and now we're getting this torsion with peak compression. And maybe if those things are occurring at the same time, that, that might be bad. And there's some previous animal literature to suggest that, it, and I just haven't taken off with it in, in my research beyond that. And because I know you've got a, a, a sort of interest in, uh, in, in the world of footwear as well. And I know you've collaborated with Rich Willie, who's, who's been on a previous episode for us. And he's done a lot in the footwear world as well. Do you think Brooks, I think, was their shoe called the Signature, Craig? I can't remember. Well, no, it was their, their Run Signature range. Which Run, yeah. Do you, think they were, <laughs> do you think they were on to something there? Because it all seems to have died down and gone a bit quiet. Was it just a buzzword they were using or were they, were they on to something there? I am. I, I have to admit, I'm not terribly familiar uh, with with the Brooks shoe that you're referring to. Um, oh, okay, Craig. I, yeah. Well, no, I I can't explain in detail, but the the next version of the adrenaline is really pushing that Rudd signature um, paradigm of modelling. They've taken away the medial post, so um, I think there's going to be a, it. it, it, it ha, you're right, and it has died off. Interest in it, but it's going to be resurrected again. In a, in a month or so when this new model comes on the market but um yeah that we could do a whole topic on that <laughs> That's a, i don't think i'm smart enough to do a whole topic on the free moment if i'm honest craig um my oh, questions I, are all <laughs> no no my questions are all uh ticked here craig so unless you've got yeah. anything no, well, to... the, only, the only other thing i was going to raise and we we did have a brief discussion about this before we went live was that it was more not specifically about this study, but this, this was a study that came out uh, last week. And again, it was a prospective study looking at risk factors of metatibial stress syndrome. And what I found interesting was they looked at a whole lot of things, height, weight, et cetera, et cetera. Navicular drop test, that wasn't predictive of metatibial stress syndrome. They looked at some proximal um, strength and range of motion factors that another study has linked to metatibial stress syndrome. This study didn't find a link. They looked at insole use. Again, that was not predictive of metatibial stress syndrome, but a previous study has showed orthotics use was predictive of metatibial stress syndrome. So the only things that they found were predictive were uh, female, older, higher BMI, and a previous history of metatibial stress syndrome. So really what my question sort of comment is that uh, it's... I'm trying to trying to find the one. It's just that, you know, different set of parameters being found in different studies as to what the risk factors are. And I just sort of wanted you to just comment on that. <laughs> well, I think um, there, there's some nice uh, epidemiological models coming out uh, that, that I really like. And that is the fact that I agree completely. One study will find one thing and then another study, and, and they're well done studies. They just are finding different results. And I, I suspect that these things don't act in isolation. Um, they, they act in concert with each other uh, to contribute to the injury. Um, and so I, I think if we can look um, at the idea that the cause of injury is actually the load that's being applied to the tissue and these factors that you just had up there modify that load, right? They, they might act to make it better, they might act to make it worse, um, but in concert with something else, they're all acting together. So I don't think they, they don't act in isolation. Um, and so I, I think that with some more complex statistical approaches, looking at effect modification and effect mediation, you know, we, we might get a little bit closer to finding those key, key relevant factors. Um, but I, I think that you have the intrinsic factors, you have the extrinsic factors you have that contribute to the load, and then you have the exposure, right? You can't get injured unless you have the exposure. Um, so I, I guess I agree completely with you. It's, it's hard when you look at the literature. I, I just pulled up over on, on my screen here looking at, at like fatigue and, and some of the studies on fatigue. And I think I have a slide that just the same variables that are increased in one study are, are decreased in another. Um, and, and so it's another classic example where it's hard to know um, 
what's going on. And this is the, the struggle and the beauty of, of human subjects research. It's just not. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it could, we could well be a, another variable that they didn't include in there that if they included it, they may have ended up finding a totally different set of results. Right. You know, and, that, and that's that's the sort of issue I have is that you know it's the choice of what you choose to include as the factors you investigate in your prospective study. And as you alluded to earlier, I mean you've got to admire people that do prospective studies. They're a lot of work. Yeah, um, they're a lot of work, and it's hard to choose what are going to be the most relevant because mm. when you do a study like that, you're also trying to balance the the mm. time that it takes to get the information that you need. I mean, there's mm. there's oh, yeah. um, it's it's tough and can you measure it? Can you do it in the clinic? Can you do it in the lab? What's the best environment? Um, and so I think we just kind of keep doing our research and keep pushing it forward. I do think we're further today than we were 10 years ago, right? Yeah. So I, I think if we can look at it on a long scale, I think we're getting yeah. sort of what's the well, What could have been interesting in that study is they didn't look at step width. Um, yeah. And if that includes step width, all those other factors may not have been risk factors and that was the main risk factor or, or it may well not have been. We don't, we don't know, but that's my point. You sort of can hit off in directions and um, yeah, but I, I can recall this is about 20 years ago, quite a debate in the diabetic foot world about smoking and smoking was cross sexually linked to ulcers. But when in the prospective studies, it was actually shown it wasn't a risk factor, but mm -hmm. I think the assumption was that neuropathy and vascular disease was such a massive risk, risk factor, didn't matter if you smoked or not. So it may well be some of these risk factors don't really matter or not if something else is present. Do you right. know, like, like, and I, I again, I, I, you know, I still, yeah, I'm still thinking it through. <clears throat> mm -hmm. No, but it, it, I think I've been reading um, some of the British Journal of Sports Medicine has had these uh, recursive, uh, models of um, injury uh, from an epidemiology perspective, and they're incorporating effect mediation and effect modification. And that's something that I, I would like to learn more about going forward, um, because I think that has a strong potential to help us kind of uncover or reveal some of these patterns uh, that we're seeing. Um, oh, yeah. You know, it's one of those things like um, there, there are certain variables that we see in the literature. Um, and you you kind of wonder, well, why why is that an injury? So, or why is that injurious? Is or is it a symptom of something else? Um, yeah, no, that's... And so we did. I did a study that I presented at American Society of Biomechanics last year, where we looked. I had forty subjects with subject specific MRIs and we measured tibial stress, and I looked at all of these kinetics and kinematics that were associated with that we kind of hold in the literature and I did a big regression analysis to try to find the key um, to kind of find the key relationships and you know it was interesting because vertical loading rate is always a very t popular variable to look at but it only became significant when it was combined with other factors um, in, in that analysis that I did which I thought just kind of points to the importance of it's not just one variable that we have to change it's, it's probably a, a concert of variables acting together. Sure, yeah. Makes sense. Uh, Tim's just commented, can we have can we have another hour, please? And uh, <laughs> much as I'd love to, Tim, I'm sure the answer is probably no because yeah. Stacey's been far too generous with her time. And uh, should we bring it in for a landing, Craig? Yeah, no, I think, <laughs> I think that's, that's that's probably a good a good note to finish on. So look, thanks so much, Stacey. You know, it has been good, obviously, from Tim's comment. Uh, obviously, other people are, are learning a lot from this. I, I think there was a comment earlier on someone had not heard of free moments before. So it's something for them to pursue. And, and I will get some links together and post it on the, on the feed for people to read. So, so thanks so much for your time, Stacey. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you. It was nice talking with you guys. Thanks for the invite.